Welcome back to Packing Nursing Minutes. This is the third part of our series of post-op nausea and vomiting. And this is where I'm gonna go over the final guidelines from the 2020 consensus guidelines on management of post-operative nausea and vomiting. And then also go over some nursing interventions that are non-pharmacological that you can do with your patient um, as rescue interventions. So come with me as we improve our patient's surgical experience by minimizing their post-op nausea and vomiting. We left off with guideline number three, and guideline number three talks about if a patient has one to two risk factors, then you are going to be giving them two agents of prophylaxis. If they have greater than two risk factors, then they're going to receive three to four multimodal agents for prophylaxis. In part two of post-op nausea and vomiting video, I went over the different drug classes for multimodal prophylaxis intervention. And uh, there is two more classes that we didn't cover because I ran out of time, because remember the goal is to keep these videos at 10 minutes or less. Let's talk about those interventions. So one of the multimodal agents that is recommended uh, is gabapentin. And we see gabapentin with our orthopedic surgery patient population, but you may start to see this ordered with some of your laparoscopic uh, procedures and other surgical procedures to minimize post-op nausea and vomiting. So they're recommending anywhere from 600 to 800 milligrams pre-op, and this comes with an A1 recommendation. And just remember that with um, gabapentin, this can cause respiratory depression. So when you're recovering them on the recovery end, just take into consideration when you get report from anesthesia, did they have any multimodals pre-op? Because that is gonna affect um, how quickly they recover from the anesthesia. They can also have some visual disturbances and headaches related to having the gabapentin. Now, another recommendation for multimodal intervention is Versed, and they recommend Versed ad induction. Um, and this is an A1 recommendation. I have to say that I do see that given frequently by anesthesia because it kind of tackles two things. It provides anxiolysis um, to decrease their anxiety, which most, most patients have as they're preparing for surgery. And it has an added benefit of helping minimize post-op nausea and vomiting. Then our third multimodal agent uh, that they have reviewed is ephedrine, and they are recommending or 0.5 milligrams per kilo IM at the end of surgery. And this is coming with an A2 recommendation from the consensus. And they recommend to avoid that if the patient has coronary artery disease. I have to say, I don't see anesthesia doing this and maybe because it is an A2 recommendation and not an A1 recommendation. So I will just leave that there for you to review. Now, the next category of multimodal agents is acupuncture and IV fluids. And you may see some of your pre-op patients coming in with their acupuncture bands on. Um, at one of my older facilities, I saw this a lot with the patients. And so these acupuncture points, are, uh, there's two main points. There's the pericardium point, which is A1, and that's about three finger breaths down on to the um, ulnar nerve area where you put pressure to help minimize nausea and vomiting. And then the other one is an L, uh, 14 point, and that is in between the thumb and the pointer finger uh, pressure point there. So, and those pressure points actually come with an A1 recommendation. And then another recommendation is to minimize pre-op fasting. So, and we um, have seen this with our ERAS protocol pathways. We just wanna try to maintain euvolemia as much as possible. And then that leads into the next recommendation, which is IV fluids for euvolemia maintenance. So they recommend 10 to 30 mLs per kilo to begin that pre-op to maintain euvolemia. So it's very important to get those IV fluids up and running on a pump. I have found very good success with the D5LR 500 fluid bolus uh, post-op in the PACU when Zofran and Raglan and Phenergan and Composine have all failed in rescue intervention. And one facility that I worked at, it was a standing order with our anesthesiologist if the patient was a non-diabetic. And I will have to tell you, especially in the GYN 
and laparoscopic patient populations that are the skinny ladies, it was almost like magic. By the time they got to about that 400 ml mark, uh, they would go from looking green to returning color to their skin. And they would begin to say, wow, I, I feel like I can actually maybe begin to get dressed. And so in the uh, references, I have included a randomized control trial that has shown benefit for um, a 500 fluid bolus of D5LR for rescue intervention for you to just reference and review for yourself. So that pretty much covers all of our agents. And now we will lead into the next part, which is nursing non-pharmacological interventions for rescue therapy with post-op nausea and vomiting. So the very first thing that you're gonna do with your patient who is experiencing post-op nausea and vomiting is you want to immediately give them an amesis bag, stay at their side, have your suction ready so that they don't aspirate. Um, and then you wanna make sure that the head of bed is elevated. Um, if you can't raise the head of the bed, then you'll need to turn your patient on their side to minimize the risk of aspiration. And then encourage the patient to stay calm, um, give them reassurance that this is going to pass and um, you can put a cold washcloth under their forehead. I have found that that has been very, very effective in distracting the patient and helping giving them some immediate relief of the, the feeling of the nausea. And then I've even gone as far as turning my bear hugger on cold and just letting that run past their face and just having some cool air um, going past them. Uh, you can also put an alcohol swab underneath like um, their nasal cannula or just right on their cheek for them to breathe that in. Some people do peppermint. And then you can also just recommend for them to go ahead and do the acupuncture on the P6 or the L14 pressure point sites. And then you always want to just be yelling to a co-worker to grab one of those um, rescue emetics that your anesthesiologists have ordered for your PACU recovery. Um, and you stay with your patient if they are um, look like uh, vomiting is impending. And remember, um, there are so many different interventions that we could do at so many different phases of care. And I just want to review those phases of care. So in the pre-op setting, even before the patient even arrives, they could be getting scopolamine applied at home the night before surgery. Then you have your multimodal interventions in the pre-op area. You know, that gram of Tylenol, PO, gabapentin, um, IV fluids, rehydration. Then you have intra-op, you have the Zofran, the dexamethasone, uh, the Tiva, um, propofol, uh, minimizing your anesthetic gases and duration and time. And then post-op, minimizing your opioids, your fentanyl, your dilaudid, those are gonna trigger the nausea. Following up with your anesthesia orders, whether it's with Phenergan or Reglan or Compazine or Amend or um, continuing those IV fluids. So post-discharge nausea and vomiting, this occurs 24 hours after discharge. And um, you can identify these patients prior to surgery in the pre-admission assessment. Uh, you definitely wanna make sure that you're doing a multimodal approach with this patient population and, um, and even consider amend um, in sublingual Zofran for um, prescriptions. You just wanna avoid greasy, spicy, heavy foods. Um, things that are gonna irritate the GI tract. Stick with you know the good old classic brat diet or chicken noodle soup. There's a reason why it's been tested and tried and true. Um, and Jello and uh, ginger ale, even carbonated fluids have been found to help minimize post-discharge nausea and vomiting. Now to kind of just wrap it all up, let's go ahead and review the consensus guidelines. I'm gonna kind of wrap guidelines four, five, six, and seven into a little nutshell here. Guideline four is to administer prophylaxis therapy in your children pa patient population as the same as you would in your adult patient population. And they recommend using a combination therapy. This is the most effective. And remember, we did talk about that earlier, um, Zofran, dexamethasone. Now, guideline number five says that we should provide an antiemetic treatment to patients with post-op nausea and vomiting who did not receive prophylaxis or when the prophylaxis treatment failed. So that is, again, just reiterating, we're going to give them another agent if they're still having post-op nausea and vomiting. And then ensure multimodal post-op nausea and vomiting prevention and timely rescue and treatment. 
um, in the clinical setting. So you wanna be on this. You don't wanna be um, dragging your feet and intervening on this. Guideline number seven is to administer multimodal prophylaxis antiemetics in the enhanced recovery pathways. I thank you for watching all three videos in this series. I really appreciate all of your comments. I'd love to hear what are you doing? Um, and is there something that um, you might be practicing that uh, you could share with us to further improve our practice and move towards evidence-based practice. Thank you for tuning into Pack Your Nursing Minutes. As always, this channel is for knowledge sharing. I recommend that you follow your physician's orders, you follow your hospital's policy and procedures, you follow your enhanced recovery pathways. Please take this to the next level and uh, review the evidence for yourself. So I thank you for tuning into Pack Your Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kath.